Right, so the question of tonight was, uh, or, or the proposition was, um, what's the problem with identity politics? And it's an interesting proposition because I think, first of all, you have to say that there's nothing wrong with identity. And identity, an interest in identity and identity politics often becomes conflated. So identity uh, is incredibly important. Sometimes it's very, very important to me that I am a woman. Sometimes it's very, very important to me that I'm second generation Irish. Um, other times it's not. But certainly the way that we define ourselves as human beings is through our identities, our relationship. How we form ourselves is very important, certainly very important for how we then interact with society. And I think that that as a starting point is, is an important one because in many ways I think identity politics kind of twists that position or uh, uh, even bastardises it because what it says is that identity is not important to who you are and the formation of your ideas and your interaction with society crucially but that identity politics says that all that matters is your identity and how you see yourself through the lens of your identity. So all that matters is that I am a woman and all that matters is that I am second generation Irish. And that will be the only frame through which I will engage with and view the world. It's a very kind of closed notion, whereas actually I think the formation of identity is a much more fluid and ever-changing thing or should be. Uh, and it's interesting to because, as Paul said, people are talking about identity politics, it feels like non-stop. But it's actually quite a, a kind of newish thing. Uh, certainly the interest in it is, is a very newish thing. So the, the unquestioning celebration of identity politics among many political sects at the moment is, is a new thing. It's a kind of, uh, people sometimes label it as a thing that happens on university campuses where uh, very zealous students uh, get very het up about what some of us might see as uh, rather petty issues, things like cultural appropriation in relation to um, types of rice, as we saw in the news recently, or hairstyles, or in relation to feminism and women, um, a less silly and more serious discussion about uh, trans rights, trans women, and women's identity, womanhood. Um, actually, the the kind of the formation of identity politics or, or where it really came from. Um, it's not something that has been politics forever. Politics has not always been identity politics. But I think the way I track it is that um, it, within the kind of civil rights movements, the gay rights movement, the women's liberation movement of the 70s and late 80s, it's really there where you start to see identity politics starting to take shape. Uh, there was a very interesting article by Ken and Malik in The Observer this last weekend, where he positioned identity politics as really finding its first major expression in relation to the fact well that got put out against Salman Rushdie. And it was there that you had the idea of a taking of offence against an identity and the formation of a politics around an identity, a religious identity. Um, that sort of was a, was a new thing that was happening. And certainly from my point of view, my research in relation to the book in relation to feminism, you had, uh, you often get this kind of arcing of the women's liberation movement from the suffragettes right up to today, and everyone was uh, involved in feminism and the identity politics of gender, uh, but actually really only came the idea of a women's movement, um, a segregated women's movement, a women's politics and identity politics in, in really around the 80s when you had some quite radical maybe questionable notions of uh, women-only spaces that uh, quite influential text, Our Bodies, Ourselves, which was all about women forming their political ideas on the basis of their gender, of their womanhood, and seeing the world as women through the lens of, of women. And I used to say, when I argued against identity politics, that really it was a technical question that I had in relation to it. So I used to say that Identity politics is understandable because identity is important. And really, the reason that I disagree with it is, is tactics. It's that it's better to argue for everyone to be involved in a discussion rather than just having these segregated groups. So you can only talk about women's mm -hmm. politics if you're a woman. You can only talk about racism if you are someone who is not white. Um, so it was, a, yeah, it was kind of a technical, tactical argument. Um, 
But actually, I think that it goes further. And certainly the explosion of the row about identity politics in the last few years has um, made me think a bit deeper about it and think, actually, what is, it, what is the problem with identity politics? Um, I think that at its heart, my issue with this, this way of looking at politics and engaging in politics is because it focuses everything so directly on the self. Um, and the word narcissistic gets thrown around a lot, and sometimes it's not very helpful. But I think there's an, there is an interesting um, criticism to be made about identity politics that you are asking someone to frame their outlook and their engagement with society purely on their self um, and purely on how they see their self. It's a very inward-looking thing. So to take the example of feminism, much, if not all, of contemporary feminism, and by that I mean what people throw around as third wave, um, second wave or third wave feminism, the kind of stuff that's come in the last 20 years, is about how women are represented, how we see ourselves, do we see ourselves in boardrooms, do we need quotas, how are we viewed in the media, is it the kind of, you know, the legsit headlines of sexist media, is it about how does that affect ourselves with body image and uh, expectat beauty expectations of women, it's all very inward looking. And, and I remember writing something about how feminism asks women to go into the toilet with a mirror and look up their own backsides and everyone being very horrified by that. But I think it's kind of a good analogy of where this interesting paradox in which life is becoming so much freer for so many people, certainly in a country like the UK. Uh, and yet we're so now involved in asking people to look inwards rather than outwards. So everything will be defined by yourself rather than I think what politics should be about is by things being defined by what you want outside of yourself, what society you want to live in. And believing that your identity defines your experience in that way is incredibly limiting. So if I was only interested in women's politics, I mean, despite the fact that it's pretty much all anybody now talks about, open any newspaper on any given day and there will be an article about feminism, um, putting that aside, if I, so I, you know, I could take up all my time doing it, but putting that aside, if I was only to think about that and only to look about that, I would have an incredibly closed and boring political life. I wouldn't have very much to talk about. I would also be denying myself the right to have opinions about other aspects. So uh, the fact that I am second generation Irish, so I was born here, does that mean that I can't talk about my father's experience of being an immigrant? Does that mean that I can't talk about my cousin's experiences who are all of the mixed race? It can, does it mean that I can't talk about men's experiences? So it, identity politics really destroys the notion of solidarity, the notion of a universalist open outlook on politics, the you know, bringing together of different ideas and different people within groups, allies, the kind of things that the left used to be, uh, and speaking of someone on the left, used to be incredibly involved in in the past, bringing together people outside of just their own outlook on the world and getting them interested in other things that might not necessarily directly affect them. So in that way, that kind of narcissistic focus on the self means you, you really live a sheltered life politically. You really don't get to engage in anything else that's going on. And it also makes for some very ugly battles. Um, Picking up on what happened recently, I don't know if you'll all know, I read about um, the recent banning of the Women's Place UK meeting um, by Leeds Council, which was you know, kind of done on a technicality. Um, but that really highlighted for me the, the row between uh, trans activists on the one hand and TERFs, as they're called, trans exclusionary radical feminists on the other hand, and the debate about what it means to be the, a woman on the one side trans activists saying, uh, as I understand it, being a woman is simply a statement of fact or it's something that you can say you are one day and say you are another day. And then uh, the TERFs, though I think that's a terrible term, but let's, let's go with it, the TERFs on the other hand, um, argue that a woman's experience is defined by her oppression by men. And um, last time I checked, as someone as a woman, uh, that neither of those descriptions, I think, fits me uh, in any way, shape or form. And I wouldn't subscribe to that identity at all, either side. And you've got this very, very ugly row about 
how to define identity. Uh, you've also got it in relation to some discussions about um, certain identity groups claiming that you are not a, a, a real, you are not a real and authentic woman or you're not a real and authentic um, black person if you cannot get along with the idea of identity politics. There's been some kind of, even though I'm not a conservative, I find myself sympathising with um, some black people who are conservatives who are being demonised for the fact that they do not um, denounce this political view because they are not seen as being that authentic identity group. And we've seen where that argument has gone throughout history. The idea of authentic identities is something that um, to me is quite a, quite, not just an uninteresting but quite a dangerous route to go down. So what is, if, if that's what's the problem with identity politics, if it's about the self, if it's about, as I'm positioning it, as about narcissism, and why are so many enthralled to it? Uh, why is it so popular? And I don't think it's because people want to be uh, narcissists or people want to um, trash each other or want to have these ugly rows. But I think it's because politics with a big P has kind of left the building. And certainly the left has a lot to answer for in this row. I think the move away from a universalist outlook on politics, a solidarity among people, uh, a look at what is the bigger picture in society, so big questions of how we want to run society in relation to you know, housing, immigration, equality, the economy, all these things have sort of left the building and we're now spending our time rowing about what some politicians said to someone in relation to cultural appropriation or what one writer did where they accidentally or on purpose um, misrepresented one identity group group and I think it's because we've gotten away from the idea that there is more to do there is more to think about in relation to society this closed nature has kind of blinkered us to the big battles and so in in going forward what I kind of propose is that we really ditch the idea of identity politics like I said it hasn't been around very long enough for it to really um be too solidified uh, in our sort of con political conscience. And it's also it isn't adequate. It doesn't lead to any road of, of general equality or general universal freedom. Do we want to live in a world in which we are all defined by our identities and kept separate? As it happens, I don't think supporters of identity politics think that either. I think that what we really want to do is start looking at what brings us together. And that sounds cliche, but I think it's worth saying these days rather than what separates us and really reinvigorating the idea of solidarity across identities and celebrating the idea that it really doesn't matter who you are and it really doesn't matter what you are in fact most of the time it's massively uninteresting it's it is of no consequence what my identity is what's of consequence is what you say and what you do and what you believe in and you don't have to be any certain identity to have an opinion on that I think getting back to a kind of universalist outlook, though I'm sure some might say that that's a kind of airy-fairy view of things, is actually a, not only a core principle of the left, or should be, from my point of view, but is also a much more beneficial way of doing politics, of talking politics. That means we can all have an honest discussion about what kind of society we want to live in. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Can you all hear? Oh, I've got this on anyway. Um, so I'll start by framing what I mean by, or what identity politics means to me. I think part of the problem is it's been used so consistently as a pejorative or negative term that we lose sight of what is actually encapsulated by the term. So for me, if identity politics means recognising how people's identities impact upon their lived experiences and then trying to seek political so solutions to inequality, then I think identity politics is something worth pursuing. If we look at the experiences of black people in the UK, at school, black people are three times more likely to be excluded. In contact with the police, black people are more likely to be arrested, more likely to be stopped and searched, more likely to be tasered, more likely to be killed. If we look at housing, black people are more likely to live in substandard housing, 
black people are more likely to be victim of incidents like Grenfell. So it seems to me that the identity of black people impacts upon their lived experiences and should be a political concern. If we look at women, women are paid less than men. Women are less likely to be in the boardroom of top companies. Women are more likely to be a victim of sexual assault. If we look at the impact of austerity over the last few years, it's more likely to impact on disabled people far more harshly. So it doesn't seem um, much of a stretch to me to suggest that our politics should consi consider the impact of gender and disability. Having said that, I would offer a slight caveat maybe and say that we can move as important as identities are, they are important because they situate us within a power structure. Our identity positions us in relation to the way power is distributed. I would suggest that we should turn the focus onto these power structures. For clarity, what I mean by power structures might be systems of white supremacy, systems of capitalism, ableism and patriarchy. The systems that oppress people of colour, disabled people, women, people from marginalised groups. I think, the, I think the focus on structure is useful because it grasps at the root rather than focusing on the identity itself. And I think there are a number of advantages. So although I think um, liberation movement should be led by people with lived experiences, I think thinking about structures or ideologies allows us to recognise that it's far more important to be an anti-racist than to be black or brown. I would far rather have an anti-racist pursuing my political interests than Sajid Javid, for instance. Same goes for feminists. It's far more important to be a feminist or to be committed to the liberation of women or end to patriarchy than it is to be a woman. I would, far, I would much rather have many of our po politicians, including Jeremy Corbyn, pursuing a feminist agenda than Theresa May. It allows us to see the difference between whiteness as a system and white, white people. So when anti-racists offer a critique of whiteness, white people don't need to take that personally. Think focusing on structures can allow us to recognise the role for men in feminist movements and allow us to see the difference between identity politics that perpetuate inequality and those that move against inequality. So what I'm really saying is power needs to be at the centre of our understanding of identity politics. I would also say that, that identity politics, and it's important to recognise this, emerges out of a failure of mainstream politics, a failure of mass movements. It doesn't just come from nowhere in the 80s. It came because left movements didn't take seriously the needs of black and brown people, disabled people, women, trans people. Sarah Ahmed says that too often, if a critique is made of a system, made of a racist system or a sexist system, the person making the critique becomes framed as the problem. I think that's partly what happens with identity politics. People who talk about identity politics are raising legitimate concerns about our system, but the system, the backlash from the system frames those people as the problem. I think the calls for an end to identity politics place the burden or misplace the burden on those from marginalised groups. I think the burden needs to be replaced on the movements. Movements should, should start from the margins um, and I think we can celebrate the end of identity politics when we have a mass movement that is committed to bringing an end to patriarchy, an end to white supremacy, an end to ableism and an end to the systems that oppress the majority of people. I would also say, um, just slightly in response to other, that I, th I think identity politics can be intersectional. I think it's a bit of a straw man to set it up as something that fixes you as a woman who can't take 
an interest in anti-racism. I think any um, good politics, a feminist politics, should embrace anti-racism. And people like Bell Hooks make the case that it would and should. Um, I've got some more comments, but I'll leave it there for now and we can discuss afterwards. Right, so I'm just going to add a few thoughts to what's been said already, really. Um, I mean, I think we can't dismiss the importance of identity politics historically, black civil rights movement, feminism, gay rights movement and so on, have been absolutely key in shaping positive forces uh, moving forwards. Um, and given the levels of racism and xenophobia um, and Islamophobia in this country and across Europe and elsewhere, um, and high levels of assault and abuse of women um, and of trans people and the, all the various other problems that we've got that relate to identities. Um, we can't possibly say that identity politics are unimportant. Um, and I think at identity level as well, and you, Ella, started, you talked about this quite a bit, um, identity politics are important. So, for example, for me as a bisexual person, um, you know, I've drawn sucker from my bisexual colleagues who've talked about the way in which we're invisibilised in the media and in society and marginalised um, and the importance of visibility as a way of gaining strength but also um, possibly some political change towards inclusion which actually isn't too bad in the UK but is in many other countries unfortunately. Um, so I think it's important at both an identity level and a social level, a uh, political level. But I do have a lot of problems with identity politics. Um, some of these have already been discussed. Um, the first one is around intersectionality. Now, as you probably all know, intersectionality sees our different social forces as being rooted through each other to form individual subject positions. So, you know, so, for example, I'm not just white and bisexual and have a female body and I'm currently middle class, currently relatively able-bodied. You know, those things all combine to form a particular subject position and the same is, is true for all of us in our different ways. So I do think it's difficult with identity politics. It can be quite reductionist. You know, people get to be seen as just female or just whatever it is. Um, although I totally take your point um, that that would be a false route to go down. Um, I think we have to remember that intersectionality does offer routes for understanding complexity and also for what we call strategic essentialism, which is where people take a stand on the basis of identities at a particular time to achieve a particular aim. And maybe that's one area where identity politics can be really useful. You know, so for example, if you're fighting a feminist battle and you say, you know, I'm a pro-feminist man or I'm a pro-feminist woman um, or whatever, um, you know, that's strategic essentialism, but it doesn't mean that you stop being black or white or whatever else you are. So that's intersectionality. Now, I do think that there's a real issue about negative, negativity around particular identity politics. So, I mean, obviously we can look at the right wing um, and, and racist politics, white racism. Um, but um, I have to say that also um, I have been really shocked at the level of transphobia that's come from um, cisgender feminists. Um, and I just think it's so sad because most feminism was about equality and it was about bodily rights and self-determination. And I just feel that things have gone very wrong. Um, you know, when there's this kind of assault on a, a group of women who are basically very marginalised and offer, often suffer um, from abuse and sexism just the way that cisgender women do. Um, so I think there's sort of problem with toxic identity politics sometimes. Um, there's also the issue of identity politics potentially repelling allies. Now again, this was kind of raised in the early discussions. Um, you know, if it's only women who can do feminism, well, where's that going to lead us? You know, my 10-year-old male-bodied child wants to go out and tackle sexism, but can't he call himself a feminist? You know, that doesn't make sense. It's not useful. It's not politically useful. Um, it's a dead end because what we need is alliances to tackle structural inequalities. Um, there's also the issue of um, groups being overlooked um, simply because there is a lack of awareness. So, for example, that research that we did on intersex people and people with variations of sex characteristics, that's something that is really very, really quite invisible in the media. 
So people don't talk about the fact that, you know, people are born with bodies that are somewhere in between male and female, and that's a perfectly valid thing to have. But there's no identity politics base because those people are so marginalised, they don't have the energy to do it, and not all of them actually want to identify as intersex, and certainly not to be political because they just want to get on with their lives just like everyone else. So there's this issue of people being completely overlooked. And I think that this extends to lots of different marginalised groups. So, for example, people with neurological conditions who maybe don't have either the wish or the ability. Some, of, some people with neurological conditions might not have the wish or the ability to take part in identity politics to gain rights for these very marginalised groups. Um, people who are considered unattractive aren't necessarily going to want to organise on the basis of that because it's so heavily marginalised and stigmatised. Um, people who are very poor or destitute might not have the time, the energy, they're too busy trying to you know, survive and get a roof over their heads. Um, so that I suppose there are all of these identities which could become politicised but either can't or don't or do so in ways that are less politically efficacious as compared to some other more powerful identity politics groups. So I think that there are a lot of structures of inequality around identity politics that we need to consider. Um, and I think it very much depends on context. You know, sometimes it's useful, identity politics, but sometimes it's not, and we need to be moving towards alliances, again, getting back to this <coughs> issue of inequalities on a structural level that will tackle poverty, homelessness, sexism, abuse, etc. Um, so I think I'd like to stop there, because I know that you've got lots of questions, um, and thank you very much for listening. Okay, what I'm going to do, because uh, I didn't set my stopwatch and let all speakers go over a bit, I'm going to go straight out to the audience. Remy and, Sa and uh, Sarai, you've had a bit of a chance to kind of respond to some of what's been said before you. Hell, you haven't at the moment. You'll, once you've come back from the audience, you'll get the chance then to also re-pick up on what each other said and come back. So, right, diverse range of views uh, on the issue. Uh, what do you think? Who has any questions or any comments? Um, I came here unsure exactly what I meant by identity politics and having heard three speakers I'm even more confused <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of the differences are about the subtle differences of definition rather than what you think I'm sure that you think different things as well I find it really helpful to know what the speakers meant by identity politics Anybody else? I don't think it is better that we should be concentrating on relating to people as individuals. I, I, my children were brought up in an African country, and when they were small, they didn't take any notice of who their school friends were, what colour they were. It didn't matter. They just related as children, and I think identity politics doesn't help this because what you also have is you have a conflict of identities. So which one takes precedence? You're supposed to have religious freedom, but for some Christians, perhaps some Muslims or whatever, it's difficult for them to express their views without being ridiculed. So I, I really do feel that it's it's a very dangerous area. That I very much agree with what Ella has said. And thank you for her really good presentation. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to say that I think there's been a real misunderstanding of identity politics or the way that it's been framed. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember everyone's names. Um, so I'd just like to say that I think that the way that both the two women on the end positioned their arguments, I felt as though you simply just ignored um, really key aspects. <coughs> sorry, I'm just sorry. I'm on the um, I felt like you were suggesting that those who are politically marginalised don't get involved um, because they weren't able to or that that's not an option that's for them. And I actually think that what you were saying about the structures that, that surround a Western capitalist world that we live in actually mean that, that people who live on the margins aren't able to get involved politically in the way that they would. So I, I just think I agree completely that it was, that the both of the arguments can do based on a strong a strong man. 
they seem to completely just discount people's identities altogether, having any part found in part. And I just think really our personal relationships to our identity are very political and we need to take account of those. Thank you. Thanks for three of you. Very, very interesting. Um, there was a lot of discussion about the idea of inequalities and structural inequalities um, across all three to an extent, and particularly the last two um, presentations. And also the idea that there are um, people marginalised within their identities because of structural oppression. Um, this is an argument that's often used by the far right as well. Um, in terms of who's marginalised and who gets to claim marginal identities and I think it's become a real problem um, here and in fact across the world in terms of who is claiming that identity as marginalised and how that's seen arise in far right views and I wondered if you would just talk to that theme as well please. I was going to say, I agree that um, often people who raise issues of identity and say, actually, it, I don't feel like this, and this is why I personally want to, in my own identity group, talk about this issue and separate to everybody else. I feel like they are definitely blamed for, for ruining the sort of like progress and they're seen as sort of creating rifts. But I would say, do you not think? that it's quite important for some people whose voices have never been heard to have a space on their own where they can say, actually, the narrative that's been told about me or people like me, I don't agree with and I'm not going to just sort of roll over, just move on and let's all unite together and like pretend it never happened. Like I want the space personally to talk about this on my own without interference from maybe certain groups who have always um, had their thoughts heard throughout history and so it's like their time has been and I would like my time now alone and then we can all go off together <laughs> <laughs> I'll take uh, I'll come back after this I'll take one more uh, to check my hand um, I think the uh, the biggest problem with identity politics uh, is highlighted by the example uh, of uh, the issues within um, gender rights movement, gender identity movement and feminist movement, in that there's an implicit assumption that all of politics is a zero-sum game, and that somehow the rights of feminists are at the expense of other people with other gender issues. And this extends across the board. And it again implicitly reduces the capacity for empathy and sympathy which any healthy community and society should have uh, and that's why I think the point about uh, focusing more on power structures is important because there are a whole load of issues that don't relate to our, our identities that suddenly come and bite us in the backside a whole load of people in this city in this area two Christmases ago suddenly became flood victims and the power structures have to be prepared to engage with those issues and anticipate them. And if we as groups just dwell in our little identities and pri uh, prioritise our narrow interests, those issues will not get addressed. I'll come back to you two first on the next, on the next round. So I'll start off with uh, Ella. Do you want to come back first on some of those points? Anything the other panellists have said? Can, should I take this out? Okay. Um, so what is, I'll just start with what is identity politics because we should probably clear that up. Um, but I, the way that I see it is simply as a politics that, that encourages you to engage through the lens of your identity first and foremost or only. So it would be, you know, a feminist politics is to my mind all about women um, seeing them, you know, viewing their engagement in the world as view, via their experience as women or you know, substitute any identity group in that place and, and that way. So it's, for me, it's really quite simple. Um, I think what a, a nice example um, to use of my criticism of identity politics is um, picking up on something that Remy said about patriarchy and capitalism. Um, 
I get into a lot of trouble for saying the patriarchy is a myth or a ghost in the corner. Um, and that's because when counterposed with capitalism, we're talking about power structures, um, it, it really falls down because there are uh, as many female, or no, there's not as many, but there are plenty of female capitalists um, and plenty of female uh, bosses exploiting workers um, enough to criticise. There are. I mean, a, a, a cursory glance at the gender pay gap row within the BBC would make your eyes water, the kind of uh, telephone book paychecks that some women are getting at the BBC. Um, what patriarchy, and this is, this is the kind of heart of my criticism of identity politics, um, what something like a look at the patriarchy or the idea that women are oppressed by men um, encourages is that female and male workers see themselves differently. So a uh, traditional left-wing style politics of old would be about workers' solidarity. It would be that it doesn't matter that the two of us are, have different, whatever way you define gender, different body parts or different identities. We are both being screwed over by the boss and we will both take action um, for uh, our class um, to enact freedom. And what I think identity politics suggests is that women and men in that position should see themselves with different uh, objectives, different desires. One example uh, in feminist history, which is very useful to think about, was the Ford Dagenham strikers, the women who were working in the Ford factories. Now, they were not being listened, this was in the 60s, they were not being listened to because they were women and they had a industrial uh, question, they had a question about the value of their pay and the trade unions, which were predominantly men, were not listening and they used a sort of quasi -lim women's liberation movement within themselves not to um, enact an identity politics, not to base it on, the, on purely as themselves as women, but to get the trade union movement to incorporate a proper workers' solidarity which involved both women and men. So it was a kind of, you know, it was, it was a quite standard um, left-wing workers' solidarity position. It wasn't the same kind of thing that you get today, which separates people on the basis of their gender. I think it's, it's a pretty, I mean, there's been some in sharp intakes of breath, but I think that it's pretty uncontroversial to say that it's a better way of fighting for freedom if we are all doing it. And Remy made a very good point about saying that, about talking about intersectionality. Uh, you know, intersectionality is this word that gets thrown around. I think it's much better to just talk about plain old solidarity and say that your interests and your desires to fight for freedom are mine as well, if we all want to live in a society that is more free and equal. I don't see why identity uh, in the kind of personal way should come into that. And just the final point before I pass the mic microphone over. There was a point made about uh, people, uh, certain groups having been given the platform for millennia and, um, and now certain identity groups who have been marginalised throughout history want to have a space for themselves. Now that's very understandable and uh, a completely laudable position on the one hand because it's, it's you know, that's about social and that's about who you want to talk to, and that's not saying that you have to absolutely f seek out the opposite identity to you and row about things with that. That would be ridiculous. You know, I have a women's meeting every Saturday night. It's called When I Go Out With My Friends, and we don't invite partners. That's just what we do. That, that's not engaging in identity politics. But the difference is, if you are only talking to a room of people who share the same identity as you, and what you're talking about is wanting to change the world, you won't ever get anywhere. This is one of the key barriers about identity politics for me. It's not engaging with the real world and it's not engaging with people who you have to change minds. You are never going to change the minds of white racists if you never bloody talk to them, if you never convince them that it's a much better view to not be racist. I think identity politics in that kind of segregation um, desire that it has really blocks progress. It, it, it blocks any moving forward in relation to freedom fighting. We like sharp intakes of breath at Leeds Salon, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so a USP. Go on. I think the, the final point about not convincing white racists, my point was that we should focus on structures. So it's not necessarily about convincing white racists. It's about changing systems in terms of employment, in terms of education, in terms of policing, the criminal justice system, health, that systematically disadvantage groups of people. That's what's more important than being called, what I realise there's cameras, whatever on the street, 
that's not the, that shouldn't be the primary concern. Um, the first question was about definitions. I provided my definition at the start and I, I did that because I think it's really important that we are clear on what we're talking about. I think within this that there's, there are quite a few straw men that are, have been set up to pursue a particular argument. Um, again, my definition, the definition I'm working of, so you know um, the underpinnings of my arguments, uh, is that identity politics is a recognition of the way identities impact upon people's lived experiences and an attempt to redress that through political means to bring about equality. Um, the second question was, or the second comment was about identities and I think again it's this idea that identities are fixed or are, are we fixed as men or women, I just don't think that's the case. Um, my own research shows that people hold multiplic multiplicitous, I should be able to say that because it's in the title, <laughs> multiplicitous <laughs> identities. They can identify as men, as, as black, as mixed race. They can identify in a whole range of different ways all at once or identities that change situationally or across the course of a lifetime. So I don't think we need to see identity is fixed in that way and I think that's part of what Kimberly Crenshaw's work on intersectionality encourages us to see. Um, the example that Ella gave of the factory, Crenshaw's work on intersectionality is also based in a factory in the US and in that factory black women are being disadvantaged at work. They seek redress through the courts Firstly, um, they, they file for discrimination as women, which is unsuccessful because white women in the factory are not suffering from that discrimination. In the second instance, they file for discrimination in terms of race, which again is unsuccessful because black men are not being discriminated against in the same way. So that's where we get intersectionality from because they are discriminated against because they are black women specifically. I think we really need to, to cling on to that and recognise where the term came from as well. The second point, again, that, that your children grew up in Africa, um, I'd be interested to know where in Africa, but as someone who's just done research on the African continent in West Africa, Ghana specifically, because it's important to name countries in Africa, because it's not just one place, um, it's nice that your children felt that way, but I can tell you white supremacy still shapes societies on the African continent. It still impacts upon who gets employed. It still impacts upon the way wealth is distributed. So it's very nice, but perhaps your, your, your children or your family should have been more aware of the way race politics work on the African continent. I've got more, but I'm taking up a lot of time. Should I pass it on? Yeah, hopefully we'll com come back later. Um, I'll try to whiz through some of these questions quite quickly. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is, isn't it better to relate to people as individuals, which follows on directly from your comments. Um, identity politics doesn't help with this. Um, I totally agree. I think it can really get in the way focusing on identities and differences to basic human relating. Um, absolutely. But that's the problem with all sorts of human communication and categorisation. It's not just identity politics. Um, I think that that awareness that identity politics can get in the way needs to be counterbalanced by an awareness of the need for the recognition of structural inequalities and the way in which people are positioned differently socially and have access to different resources and uh, different ways of doing lives. Um, that also needs to be acknowledged. Otherwise, you know, basically the only people who can enjoy that nice space of just relating without thinking about identities are the people in the privileged positions. It's the white people, it's the cisgender women, it's the straight people. Because basically if you become one of those what we call subaltern groups or you have a, different, a number of different subaltern characteristics where you're not part of the mainstream that occupies privilege unthinkingly, then you will soon become aware of the disadvantages that you face that are perpetrated on you by the people who basically run society. So. I think it is important to have both, okay. Um, now the structures meaning people, um, oh gosh, this was a difficult one. Um, <laughs> needing to acknowledge the importance of identities. Um, actually there are a couple that were a bit like this, a couple of, of questions and comments. Um, I absolutely agree. I think 
our, our identities are really important and um, dismiss talking critically about identity politics doesn't mean individual people's identities aren't important. I think the critiques that certainly we've raised tonight are probably more about identity politics as tactical and whether it's efficient and whether it works, which I think it sometimes can, but sometimes it doesn't. Not about undermining people's own identities, and particularly for people who are marginalised and maybe haven't had space to seek solidarity and to rework things that have been imposed on them. Um, absolutely important to have space that belongs to that group only, if that's what that group wants. It's been a sort of fundamental part of um, consciousness raising ever since the 70s, certainly feminist groups, um, lots of other groups of marginalised people. I'm not saying that feminists are always marginalised, by the way, but, you know, I think sometimes we get lost between thinking it has to be either or. And citizenship theory is quite useful here because it, you can talk about universal human rights and having a universal approach to pushing society forward in a more liberal direction, hopefully, a more tolerant direction. But you can also talk about particularism and the need to focus on the specific needs and interests of certain groups at different times. And I think that's really important. Um, I will stop in a minute, but um, the far right and marginalised identities, I think we touched on that a bit when we talked about toxic identity politics. It's certainly a massive problem. Um, and I think the political disenfranchisement that um, many more impoverished groups are facing feeds into it and obviously the, all the political problems that we're facing in the world at the moment. Yeah, it's a problem, isn't it, that needs to be recognised. I mean, there's no easy solution. Um, but, um, you know, identity politics are being deployed in some very, very scary ways. Um, okay. I think the last one I've got is the importance of focusing on power structures, not just identities. Um, but that might have come from you. <laughs> so maybe it's time to stop, but I think it's very important that we look at uh, power uh, structures. Very, very small. Yeah, it's just because I forgot your question. It was a really good one in relation to the, to the far right and toxic identity politics. I mean, I think, I think it, you get into a sticky situation when you start saying what is good identity politics and what is bad identity politics. Remy gave a very comprehensive list of um, true stats in relation to the persecution of black people. There is a stat, um, there is a, a fact that white working class boys are least likely to go to university. So, I mean, you can imagine, you can imagine the uproar if that got turned into an identity politics position. Um, and the fact that some Tommy Robinson fans, uh, these kind of people are um, jumping on the desire for identity politics and creating a white identity politics, which is raising its fairly ugly heads in America. So once you open the door to the fact that you should coalesce around your identity and form your political outlook around your identity, it doesn't lead to very good places. And you can't say that because right wingers want to, or some right wingers want to identify around being white and being marginalized as they see it, that then you have the other side of black people or women. So, it, you know, it's a very, this is it, it's a very confusing and not very helpful route to go down because you can't, you know, you can't legitimately say, well, your identity and your identity politics is wrong if it's based on my identity. Who are you to tell me, not who are you, but who are you to tell me about my identity and my identity politics? Can I, can I just say very quickly, uh, David Gilborn, a critical race theorist in education, he's debunked that, that gets banded around every single year that white working class boys are least likely to go to university. It's just not true. Uh, check out well, hang on. I mean, that's what I've done recently. Yeah, what I've just done recently. That's what we. I mean, it's, I know, it's an da uncomfortable David fact. But then David you Gilborn, go. professor in uh, critical race theory and education at Birmingham University, has shown it to be a myth. It's an inflation of the working class category. 60% of the population identify as working class. The data you're talking about is based on free school meals, which is far, far lower proportion. Um, and. I, I, no, I'm, I'm hesitant because I don't want to suggest that the problems of, of that particular population are insignificant. But again, you know, we need to look at it. We need to look at why that segment of the population, which is far smaller than you're suggesting, are struggling to get into university and then we're back into identity po politics. Yeah, you've seems. got two, that's it. Like right, okay, I'm going to go out to the audience groups. again. We'll just we'll go out to the audience. I just wanted to throw one thing in because in, in working week, people were saying, what's your salon on this week, Paul? And said identity politics. And everyone says, What's that which forced me to come up with the definition? And I'd say, just a very brief one, it's the, um, the, the quest 
for group recognition based on some notion of suffering. That's what identity politics is. It's the quest for group recognition based on some notion of suffering. Right? That, that's what it is in a, in, in a kind of nutshell. But, but anyway, people might disagree with that. But. three discussions. Um, all of you, I think pretty much all of you have talked about structural inequality. Uh, and for me, the ideas of um, identity politics uh, have, have kind of developed um, through the 70s and when, when the, uh, the triumph, really, if you like, of the individual, the Thatcherite, um, there's no such thing as the individual, there's community, there's only individuals. Uh, and the, the, I think the left at that point abandoned uh, the sort of outward looking uh, positions uh, to try and change the world for, for the better of everybody uh, and chased, um, uh, if you like, recruitment and, and uh, chased marginalised groups uh, such as women, blacks, uh, anywhere else where they thought the, the recruitment could happen and forgot to, 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 to continue uh, and work for a major change sort of universally. Uh, and I think what's happened is that some of the some of the groups that were traditionally represented by the left have now also become marginalised. Uh, but but we don't we don't talk about particularly the as you mentioned the white working class. Uh, they're not seen particularly as a as a, as a group that that um, or, or when they are talked about in terms of identity politics, it's a fear because we we immediately or, or, or certainly the left thinks of them as um, you know, potentially right-wing, potentially fascist, reactionary, etc. Um, my problem uh, that, that, that I have with the idea of, accept, uh, of identity politics is it can create an exceptionalism uh, within, within groups identifying solely around particular identity issues. Uh, we've, we've seen some of the uh, results of that in, in some of the um, Jewish groups and their attacks on the Labour Party and the attacks on people who are clearly not racist, uh, but who happen to disagree with some of some of their thinking, uh, and because of this this kind of exceptionalism and this this failure to, to engage with the broader um, situation uh, can can lead to all kinds of, of messy situations like that one. <coughs> Let me sort of just angrily shout about myths and Paul mentioned some notion of suffering. So I'd like to sort of tie those two <laughs> things in uh, very briefly. I mean, this, obviously this, this discussion's getting really spread out, but I want to get it right back to basics if I can, if you don't mind. I'll be as quick as I can. And it's just something that Ella said right at the beginning when she talked about the paradox that people who propagate um, the, the politics um, at a time that they're looking inward at a time when if you listen to what they're actually saying it's almost all, all being achieved and yet they're still looking inward and you'd say well what do I actually mean by that and, and I think it comes down to two words that Remy and Soraya are completely getting wrong and the words are oppression and prejudice and the two completely different things oppression is the denial of rights that we all enjoy, legally or socially. There is very little oppression today in society for any minorities anywhere. That's the fact. That's the fact. And I think Remy touched on it when he said that only certain identities have the lived experience. They can feel this. I don't think you would use the word oppression, but that's what you mean. But I'm sorry, that is completely subjective. It is not objective at all. However you look at it in society, legally, socially, in attitudes, there is very little racism today. Whoa. There is very little sexism. Whoa. Women's rights have always been achieved. There is prejudice in all those fields. They are two completely different things. You will never eliminate prejudice of individuals. You cannot do that because you're asking everybody to be robotic and completely think in one single-minded way. And that's what's happening here. And I'm also really offended by Soraya. She basically intimated, because there's all these 
phobias existed among the populations of Europe, that we still have the necessity that uh, the, the politics of identity is still important. You're basically saying we're all a seething mass of racists and sexists. Well, I'm sorry, the people of Europe are simply not like that. We have all <laughs> lived together for many generations, and despite the project of multiculturalism that wants to split us up and divide it into sex and identities, we all manage, despite that, to effectively live together as human beings do. So I think the categories you're throwing out, I would challenge, including the power structure you speak about. I, I think I'll leave it to that. Coming back down the room. Hi. Yeah, uh, I just think the last exchange between the panelists, uh, for me, sort of highlighted the real problem with identity politics. Uh, we have the second speaker saying, you know, the, the black identity group is incredibly marginalised, they can't get into university, um, you know, higher risk of all sorts of things. That was counted by a, a statistic from Ella saying actually it's, it's white working class boys who have the lowest rate of entry to university. And then straight away the response, well, you know, that statistic is wrong. Um, it was taking you know a subset of working class class people, you know, straight away we're into an argument about who actually has that identity, who has the right to say, you know, I'm this marginalised group, I have this identity. Um, you know, if you're an individual, you go to some of the, the mill towns around here, you know, look at how run that down they are, how few prospects some of the, the white people or the Asian people probably more than that uh, black people around here, you know, how, how few prospects they have around here. And you hear someone saying, well, that's it. It's the black identity that's most marginalised. Of course that's divisive. Of course that's going to be divisive. Of course you're going to get reaction. I think that, that is going to feed into, you know, the, the alt-right, the, the, the far-right, whatever you want to call it. They're going to coalesce around their own. As in this group, you're going to get this reaction, you're going to get this backlash. The whole thing is just divisive. You know, let's focus on, as you keep saying, power structures, maybe, you know, or, or class, or poverty, you know, rather than identity. I just think identity is just not useful. Uh, I'll come, go back up to the side. Right, uh, yeah, thanks. I've just got a couple of concerns about what's being said. Um, just starting off with this idea that we need to attack uh, structures and, and change things. This Nobody's actually used the expression yet, but it's, it sounds very much like an affirmative action mandate looking for positive discrimination. And uh, I, I find tremendous problems with, with, with that if, if that's what's been put on the, on the table to try and redress this, this inequality, which you, you know, you've explained. I'm not going to argue with those statistics that you've, you, 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 that you've started with uh, and, and said you know, that those groups have, uh, have struggled. In society, I'm just suggesting that the answer to, for that is not more discrimination in any direction, because it, it certainly alienates other people. And then to ring fence, um, as I suggested by just casually throwing in the, the concept of Islamophobia, that somehow uh, an ideology can be ring fenced against criticism. You know, even with criminal uh, sanctions being raised against it, so it, that now that just. Having a discussion where you say, you know, I don't agree with that, so it's, that doesn't float my boat, is now, you know, presumably going to become an offence just to protect people against this invented phenomenon of, of Islamophobia. Okay, thank you. Right, there's two hands up this side. Oh, I'm not actually sure now what I want to say, but uh, I just noticed there was a lot of hot in the room, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to. Recognise that we're here trying to deal with something that feels like it's representing what's going on in the outer world. And at the moment, we're a bit of a microcosm of the bigger world. So I did find, I noticed I felt frightened with some of the statements that were getting made. And I think that's what's happening is a culture of fear. So I just wanted to pose one thing, and I wanted to probably to ask. I mean, I am glad of all of what you're saying. I don't agree necessarily with everything that's being said by the panel. I agree more with the sum. And I notice where I lean and where I don't lean. And I'm noticing my own prejudices and noticing my own stuff. And I think it's not narcissistic to look inwards at times. I want to really challenge that. I want it to be seen as being absolutely essential 
in a world where we look outer at all the outer power structures instead of inwards for our inner power structures and our inner power struggles. And that doesn't mean to sit, we sit there belly gazing. It means we are staying with and in our bodies and in some way of being close to ourselves so that we can be present in the outer world and make connections that actually might be surprising. I might find I am making a connection with somebody who my fixed identity, if I am a woman, you know, would actually, and I am a feminist, fixed, is it? You know, suddenly makes connection with somebody else. I'm a white person, fixed. You know, these are very interesting ideas. I want to bring two concepts about the idea about being fixed and fluid. And I think that we're needing a way of being open-hearted. I notice my heart's like beating fast. Open-hearted and quite fluid about how we're looking at things. And there's one question I'd want to ask all of us, but maybe all of us in the room, is who's benefiting from this? Who really benefits from us falling out again? And I actually think there's a... <laughs> There's a structural thing in society of people who are taking no notice of this. They're flying without any permission through the world. They haven't got passports. Their money is just going fluidly between banks. And in some ways, I have a sense there's a role in society that goes, they're at it again, they're falling apart. You know, there's a bit of a divide and rule. And there's a fixed identity in my past ex Marxist <coughs> part, could be a present, which says, there is a divide and rule happening. And I, I'm interested in that without making anybody right or wrong. I think there's a lot of blame going on and I'd love us to go deeper. So rather, I was glad when you said, and it made me go deeper, Ellie, at one point. And I'd love us to go deeper again. I think we need to go deep into ourselves to come out with fresh thinking. Science enough. <laughs> Hey, I've got a few points I wanted to make, and it's kind of everything's moving so fast that I don't really know what to reply to you now. <laughs> but I wanted to come back to um, Ella's point about um, you know the, the dangerous route that identity politics is leading us. I mean, the idea that because there's a hugely toxic men's right movement developing like, across the world that's actually leading to the deaths of women, the idea that because of that we should abandon feminism as a bad idea is just completely ridiculous to me. You know, there's so many straw men being thrown around. But, I mean, the point is that people are, people are taking politics of liberation, they're twisting it to their own ends to reinforce their own privilege. And this is what we see happening in, in white power movements, white supremacist power movements are, trying, are taking something that's meant to be about liberation and equality and all the rest of it and twisting it into something that will reinforce their own privilege. And we have to fight against that. You don't just go, well, let's stop thinking about that then. <laughs> now, that's, that's gone badly. It doesn't make any sense. Um, there are some other points I wanted to make as well, but I don't know if I'm going on too long. There's a false dichotomy being set up between class politics and identity politics, when I think class is a really important part of people's identity, and any class politics should be intersectional. Um, but it doesn't mean that if you want to focus on working class interests and kind of solidar solidarity in the working class, you should ignore things like gender and race, because that is what's dividing us. Um, and also this, this idea that identity is just narcissism, when I think it's really important to say that identity is something forced on us by oppressive structures. Yeah. It's not something that people just choose on a whim. You know, it, it, it comes out of the way that things, um, the way that society acts on individuals and forces them into taking their identity. So I think that's something that needs to be considered. Um, in a way, I feel like a lot of what I've just, or like, yeah, quite a lot of what I've just heard has reinforced with me why I believe that identity politics is important because I'm not suggesting that we go off into our own groups and then we just talk in our own groups about our own groups because that already happens. So like, it's not, that's not the next step or something. It's already going on. But I mean, like, I feel. Yeah. Um, for example, being told as a woman by someone who is not a woman about what it's like to be a woman, you, I feel like at points I have to say, look, you know, I respect that you're trying to help me, you're a feminist or you believe in women's equality, but I have to draw the line and say you don't know what this feels like. 
I do, and that's why me in my group or my identity as a woman, I need to tackle this this uh, question or this point personally. And although I respect your support, I can't take it because it's not you, and you don't actually know how that feels. And you can say you understand and <coughs> live with people who are similar, or your next door neighbour is an immigrant, and therefore they told you about what it's like to be an immigrant, and you know what it's like to be an immigrant. But unless you are an immigrant, personally, I believe that you, there's certain things you just can't fully, honestly, and truly say and represent. And I'm not saying that. Um, only people of one race or one gender should be involved in a campaign for that race and that gender. But I do believe that there's a point where the people of that race or that gender need to be the front line because they're the people that know the best what it's like to be that. Uh, a woman knows best what it's like to be a woman. And I don't think that's something that you can really debate. Apologies for having the ultras. <laughs> So, you know, right, back to the panel. I'm going to start with uh, Soraya. Yeah. Um, thank you. Okay, so we had a lot of diverse and quite conflictual comments there, as you know. Um, I mean, I think that if you look at this from an overview, our society is very economically unequal. I don't think anybody could possibly argue with that. Um, and I think that a lot of the inequalities that we've got around identities or the tensions around identity politics stems from that lack of economic equality and I liked what one of the commentators said about the importance of class um, and in fact class came up quite a lot in a number of different comments. Um, if we lived in a society where the distribution of income and opportunities were more equal generally um, I don't think there would be this much conflict and this business about being distracted from what's going on in the rest of the world while we all fight amongst ourselves over identity issues is a massive issue um, because there's all this other stuff going on that we have very little knowledge or insight about, you know, around the movement of globalised capitalism and so on. Um, and it, these debates can, I think, serve as a bit of a distraction, as important as they are, and as glad as I am to be here today. And I think we need to remember that, you know, healthy debate and conflict is part of a democratic society. Okay. Now, the business about um, white working class people and marginalisation, I think, is particularly important at the moment, partly because it does fuel, you know, so many of the political problems that we're facing. Um, and... This is also tied, of course, into the economic inequalities, um, and it's not going to go away. Um, and, you know, once these things become kind of transformed into identity politics, then that is a powerful force. So I think we need to be paying more attention to that. Um, there's no easy answer, of course. Um, I mean, certainly one of the comments about the lack of prospects white working class people face, yeah, I mean, it's a massive issue. Um, you know, um, I mean, that could be dealt with by more fair distribution of um, resources, certainly. I'm losing track of my questions. Um, now, one of the people's talked about um, changing structures. Um, I'll Just to clarify, I wasn't talking about affirmative action. I don't believe that affirmative action is a particularly good route um, because it just causes backlashes and resentment. Okay. Um, but when I'm talking about changing structures, really, I'm talking about... Um, you know, flattening out some of the hierarchies that exist around um, ethnicity and gender and so on. Now, the importance of actually looking at facts, I mean, maybe this is somewhere, something that sociologists and economists and so on can be really helpful with. Um, I'm not saying that I, I've got a grasp of all of them, but what I'm saying is that if we actually look at the distribution of income and uh, opportunities and, you know, high-paying jobs and so on, they are very structured by gender and race. And, and, you know, class background as well. Um, and I don't think we can really get away from that. We can't pretend that all of the problems have been sorted out. Um, so maybe I need to disagree with one of the speakers. Um, OK. Um, I think the other thing that stood out was the importance of personal experience in understanding identity politics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we are only individual people with our own individual viewpoints at the end of the day. So... Um, maybe that's a good point for me to stop. Thank you. Um, the second 
a comment from near the back suggested that mine and uh, Ellie's argument is, the, is an example of why identity politics is the problem. Um, I disagree with that. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with the disagreement we had. I think I've now mentioned David Gilborn's incredibly rigorous work and you can go away and look at that and then you will come to recognise the, the statistics and that's how debate should work and we clarify our positions uh, and become clearer on what the facts are. Um, so, so I don't see that as a problem really. Um, the, the, the comment about white working class people being oppressed in, in mill towns Absolutely, I agree. Um, in, in my talk, I, I called for us to target capitalism as well. I, perhaps I should have said economic inequality. Um, capitalism, uh, abolishing capitalism is just indicative of my own uh, orientation. But an end to economic inequality would be fine. Um, I think it becomes a little complex when um, class oppression makes it difficult for white working class people to see how whiteness is a position of privilege. I understand if you're in a mill town and you are suffering economically, it's very difficult to see, but there's a, a real strong body of research that shows to be black and working class is fraught with difficulties above or additional to those struggles of being white and working class. Um, affirmative action, I, I, I'm undecided on it. I think one argument could be that we already have affirmative action for those from privileged groups when a white, male, middle class, able-bodied man goes for an interview, he's perhaps more likely to get that job. I'm being slightly rhetorical and I'm not fully decided on affirmative action, but that might be uh, one, one response to criticisms of affirmative action. Um, the fourth question, which I can't remember now, and I've only noted down my notes. I, I, I've, I've tried to say several times that we need an analysis of power, and I think, I think that comes back to your questions. If we understand the way power works, we can make distinctions between uh, the kind of movements that are valorizing a white identity in pursuit of um, racist agendas and those that are moving against power structures that oppress people. So, so again, I think power is important. Uh, and I, I agree movements should be led by those um, grappling with that form of marginalization, but I do think there needs to be a space for people to support that. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> We've been talking about, okay, so we, we had some initial confusion about identity politics. Let me throw in another phrase that we might um, have some confusion and argument about, and that's victim narrative. And that also gets talked about, that often gets talked about in relation to identity politics. Um, and I think for me, uh, fellow panelists have just talked about um, different oppressions, different people's uh, uh, privilege, and uh, different people's position in what sometimes gets. Um, rather there's a widely called oppression olympics so you know you have these kind of competing privileges competing oppressions and that is not to denigrate uh, the seriousness of when people are oppressed but it's to say that i think this is this is largely uh, the root of the when i was talking about narcissism and um, identity politics it, it's linked in with the victim narrative and now i'm going to go along just for this little bit, little bit of my um contribution with the idea that as a woman i can talk about being a woman even though i think that that's a facet of identity politics isn't necessarily helpful here we go um so part of my criticism of contemporary feminism links with what the one of the um contributors said at the back that to be a woman now today in 2018 in the western world is objectively better than it was for me at 26 than it was for my mother in the 70s, than it was for my grandmother in the 40s and 50s. And that is because of uh, social movements, that's because of, you know, occasionally that they didn't largely contribute very much the theorists in the 80s feminist movements. Um, it's because society has progressed and has thankfully realised to a, quite a large extent that women should be given the same rights as men. We are not 
oppressed um, via the law. We, it's illegal to discriminate us against us on the basis of sex. Um, contrary to what many think, it's illegal to pay us for the same work at different wages. So we are, there is not necessarily a gender pay gap as such, though we can have discussions about... All right. Does stop mansplaining, right? No. But... <laughs> but, <laughs> but but I'm joking, by the way. Um, but but you know the the the, the, the fact is that the f the fact is that if I can finish my point, the fact is that to be a woman today is is absolutely much better than it ever was. We are doing fantastically, and that's largely down to the feats of women. That's something that should be celebrated. And yet, and yet, contemporary feminism, in many of its arguments, positions women as victims, as oppressed. As, the, as suffering from not just prejudice, but you know, the idea of a patriarchy, the idea that men are holding us down. And you just cannot point to serious instances where that is happening on a large scale as when it used to happen with our mothers and our grandmothers. And someone raised the point of men's rights activists. I think this is a really perfect example of where identity politics and victim narrative sort of eats itself. So on the one hand, you have feminists saying, um, women are oppressed by men, it's terrible, our lives are utter misery. Um, on the other hand, now, you, men's rights activists have kind of, kind of cleverly picked up on this, the success of identity politics and victim narrative and are saying that actually with relation to you know, various arguments they use about paternity rights and things like that, that actually it's men who are impress, oppressed by feminists and that they're the real victims of oppression. And you just end up in, someone said a zero sum game earlier, you end up in this really ugly, really unhelpful, really stupid argument about competing identities. And you're not actually having a political discussion about what is going on in the world, about you know, the rights of, uh, of, of people to look after their children, about sharing of gender roles, none of these big things. What you're doing is saying, I'm more oppressed, no, I'm more oppressed, no, I'm more oppressed. And I think, crucially, for those of us who are those groups in society who are still at a loss, and there is still racism and sexism in society, it may not be to the same level that it was decades ago, but it is still prevalent. You'd be a fool to think that it wasn't. The way of dealing with that is not to say that we compete in these oppressions and, in, and inter internalise a victim narrative, but is to look outwards. I mean, you know, criticising identity politics doesn't mean that you don't think talking about racism is a good thing. It means you want to have a different kind of discussion. And I think, you know, we need to remember that when we are having this overall debate. OK, right, we're gonna, we've got time for one final round of questions and comments, but they have to be brief, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We don't have time uh, for, for a speech now, so please make them brief so we can get as many in as possible before... Uh, we round with the panelists. Thanks. Um, I, I just wanted to emphasise a point that I think has been made, but I'll rephrase it in a slightly different way, which is um, that uh, there's a sense in which the shadow side of identity poli politics is a kind of prejudice, and that's when um, one thinks one knows what somebody else uh, believes or the, the, the opinions that they hold because of the view that one takes of that person and the, the identity that uh, one projects onto them. Um, and, uh, and I don't think that that necessarily goes along with identity politics in the sense of affirming um, a certain identity, perhaps one's own identity and other people's identity, but it often does. And that can be uh, particularly aggravating when, for example, when, when, I'm, um, when somebody assumes that they know what I believe or think because uh, they, they're projecting an identity onto me of being a, a, a cisgender, um, heterosexual, white, middle-class male or something like that. Right. What, will, what will the good society look like when the goals of identity politics activists are achieved? <laughs> uh, I just want to ask all the three panelists, um, what role does um, education and national curriculum play in terms of shaping the national identity? Because if you look at the United Kingdom, so far the sort of, um, I mean, former Education Secretary David Punker was talking about sort of introducing a citizenship in GCSEs and A-levels, but so far it hasn't, you know, come true as yet. So I'm just wondering how 
education can shape the kind of a new identity for, well, British identity. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll be really quick, so I won't go. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the economic, um, Sir Ryan and Remy, I think, have sensed that um, there's a question that when they talk about identity politics, it comes down to a question of resources. And you, you two, are, I presume, will sort of be arguing that certain identities ought to be taking more of the slice of the cake. It, it, it effectively comes down to that numbers game, the zero sum game. And I think you've realised that. And you've then, so what you do is you've then said that, yes, actually, capitalism is the problem, and we want more of an economy. And I think, actually, you're being completely defensive because clearly if we have a problem, and we do have a very serious problem with capitalism, and I don't want to go into what all that's about, I think most of the industry would accept that the cake needs to be made a great deal bigger. The only way the cake's going to be made a great deal bigger is going to be taking it away or denying the very small amount of people that tend to control the rule things at the moment and have a more broader universalist a range of people throughout society that's going to change that and that will mean denying identity it will mean denying class almost we will need to go across the whole spectrum of society to make that change and identity politics does exactly <coughs> the opposite and that's your problem But um, in my student days, a statistic that was banded about was 70% of the population had 84% of the wealth. And I believe the more recent one is something like 5% of the population has 92% of the wealth currently. So we can't ignore structural issues that are always going to be very important. And identity is always important in moving things forward because we rename things, we rename slavery, uh, and we give power to people to say that that is wrong. And sometimes we have needed, we've needed white advocates or advocates from the power group, group to bring those kind of changes forward for, the, for that identity, quite rightly. Um, and I support what this my man said over here about um, identity and people shouldn't assume they know what somebody's identity is because Another thing, and I say this because I do have a Jewish background, um, research was done on the typical Jewish nose, and it's 50% true and 50% untrue. <laughs> and I find that that idea of what stereotypes are doing is that they're 50% true and 50% untrue is something we have to carry with us because then we have to see everybody as an individual and find out who and what they are. Now, um, I would also like to say one more thing, just briefly, about the need for advocates. But some groups that don't have the energy, the health, and the power to come and speak to a group like this. I'm actually electrosensitive, and most of you will not have heard of it, and I'm probably going to go because my tolerance level has been reached. So if I can act as an advocate for that group who are truly being denied in what is going on at the moment, I would like each and every one of you to log into electrosensitive UK and go to the newsletter page and read every bit of the summer newsletter. There's a lot of information there, and it will be an education to some of you, because we have to learn safe use of technology. It isn't just about the mental health of the young. It's, it's much bigger than that. And that's about all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. And I may not have to say for you to reply, yes, I am indeed a lecturer. Thank you. <laughs> It's just a quick question. If identity politics is supposed to be a, a response to sort of aggression, discrimination, I'm black, I'm a woman, therefore I suffer, why is it a case that it's got specific history that originates, like Ella mentioned, in the 1970s? Why was it that in the 40s, 50s, or you know, further back, people didn't, didn't say, well, as a woman, this is my experience, therefore it's only me that can legitimately make this argument, or as a black man, you know, those sort of arguments, those sort of divisive arguments, why is it only in the 1970s that identity politics takes off? On that note, we will uh, round up. No, Soraya has to get off, so I'll start again uh, with Soraya. Uh, so, <coughs> not just uh, obviously come back on the questions, but if there's anything else you want to sum up, up anything hanging, hanging in the air that you want to come back on, uh, please do. Well, there's an awful lot more that could be said, of course. Um, uh, um, 
I think that just to start with the first question, what would a good society look like? Well, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it would be one where we didn't have this 5% of people hoarding most of wealth and where it was spread around. And I, I don't think that any of us can really imagine what that would look like because it would radically change everything and there would be enough resources, in fact, for, you know, people of all different social groups to live a reasonable life. And I know that sounds utopian, but really for me, that's the bottom line. And I don't think that we would be scrapping about who is more oppressed than who anyone else would be. I think that's a good vision to have. There's a long way to go to get there. Um, uh, about some identities getting more of a, a slice of the cake, well, I think, you know, actually <laughs> being critical of economic inequalities really is important because there would be more and that would also mean that there would be less of the toxic right-wing politics because people would go, well, that's not right, is it? And we'd find more in common amongst each other than we do at the moment. Um, so education and the national curriculum and its role in shaping national identity. Well, I have to say that as a parent with a child going through school, I've been fairly appalled at the lack of work that they do um, around you know, citizenship, um, democracy, finding ways to get on with each other, tackling sexism, racism, etc. Um, so I think there's really an awful lot more to be done on that um, uh, in schools, but that's just me. Um, OK, I think I'd like to stop now and thank you very much for coming tonight. just going to respond to the, the comment about um, suggested that I may be making a U-turn and now shoehorning capitalism in. I don't think that's true or fair. I mentioned capitalism at least three times in my opening remarks and I think we should all be committed to, if not the abolition of capitalism, a, at least a fairer form of capitalism or uh, redistribution of wealth. Um, I appreciated the comment from over here and I think that's partly why we should focus on, on, on structures rather than uh, individuals. Um, the, the school curriculum I, I, I think has an incredibly important role to play. Um, I don't think it's in the interests of, of those in power at the moment to have a school curriculum that, that makes um, clear how these structures of oppression work, but I think it would be incredibly important for any kind of progressive movement for social change. Um, why only the 1970s? I'm speaking particularly in terms of race, but this is when we started to get uh, a, a more sizable proportion of black born, born Britons. Um, you know, migration really, or significant waves of migration from the African Caribbean um, really started in 1948, so it's, but, but, but before that, you know, Sojourner Truth in 1850 was talking about um, the intersection of racism and sexism and how in, that impacted upon her in, in, in a slave economy, so I, I'm not sure it's exactly true, um, and I think your framing of what identity politics is was, was a little um, misleading as well. My notes are really messy, so I'm sorry if I've missed one of the questions. I think really what is at the centre of, um, of, of the discussion about identity politics um, is that Though, we're though we said that we're talking about it here, everyone seems to be talking about it. I think actually the point that Paul made that lots of people um, out there kind of say, what is that identity politics or don't really spend their time talking about it is an important thing to remember. Because while um, if you read the news or, or, or hear sort of social and political commentary, you think that every woman was on board with the kind of uh, contemporary feminist notion of identity politics and and those kind of views, but when actually there is, you know, the, the, the uh, Women's Equality Party, which is the only feminist um, political party in, in mainstream politics, has uh, tiny numbers and doesn't have any representatives. So you don't have women meeting up in council halls talking about feminism and identity politics. That doesn't happen. So it's important to remember that I think uh, it's slightly disingenuous to talk about identity politics without saying that it is a rather minority position that pushes it as this quite extreme thing, that pushes it as this sort of segregated space, that pushes it as this sort of very um, 
I think dystopian view of humanity and dystopian view of people and how we interact. I just want to finish on the point of someone said about um, putting identities on people. It really boils down to this for me, is that your identity and my, my identity is important to me sometimes, very important to me sometimes, but it should never be that important to you because you should never be judging me on the basis of my identity, right? That's, that's the root of racism, sexism, and other kind of social oppressions, is a judgment on identity. You should care about what I say and what I believe in. And if you like it, come on board with me. But don't forefront my identity before you hear what I have to say. That is my issue with identity politics, I think. Thank you. Uh, again, I, I would just disagree that that is the root of racism. The root of racism is um, the need to extract wealth from the African continent. So it's structural. I, I mean, you can, you can sigh, but you know, that is the root of racism. That's where it, I, name me a text that disputes that. It, it's Do you believe only white people can be racist? <laughs> I, as, I've, I, as I've said several times, I see racism as a structural problem. I see it as a structural problem, I'm not, so interested in individual racism. I'm interested in the structures that lock certain racial groups out of positions of privilege. Okay, right. On, on that point, because we're coming to end, I'd like to thank uh, Ella, Remy, and uh, Soraya uh, for tonight. So thank you very much. <laughs>